Hello all, welcome back to Atmospheric Dynamics. We're continuing our discussion today of the wind-driven circulation. The reading is still Marshall and Plum, Chapter 10. The questions that are answered in this section are, what is the relationship between wind stress and Ekman pumping slash suction? What is, the, what is responsible for strong western boundary currents? And how does wind stress drive the equatorial countercurrent? Okay, let's talk about Ekman pumping and suction. We've already talked a little bit about how in the Ekman layer, wind stresses induce changes in the global circulation of the oceans. Now let's talk about how these wind stresses also induce vertical motion within the ocean. Starting quantitatively, recall that the continuity equation in the ocean is given by the three-dimensional divergence of the velocity field is equal to zero. This is a property that arises because the fluid is essentially incompressible. We can expand this in terms of the horizontal divergence, here shown as div uh, and uh, the vertical derivative of the vertical velocity, di w di z. If we then use that, hor that uh, there's zero horizontal divergence of geostrophic motion, this reveals that this divergence of the horizontal velocity is in fact the horizontal divergence of the ageostrophic wind, and so that allows us to simplify this equation somewhat. We also use that the ageostrophic winds are associated with friction in the Ekman layer. That is, from last time we had an equation that looked like f k cross u a g is equal to 1 over rho reference times the vertical derivative of the stress. We can transform this into an equation for u a g by doing k cross on both sides. The result is u a g equals negative 1 over f rho reference times k cross the vertical derivative of the stress. And so we obtain that the vertical velocity induced by the Ekman layer is given by 1 over rho reference k dot curl of the wind stress divided by f. Okay, what does this equation imply? Well, recall this k dot curl term has popped up before in our discussion of vorticity back in atmospheric dynamics. If we have a flow that is, counter, that is rotating counterclockwise, then typically that's associated with a positive vorticity. If it's rotating clockwise, that's associated with a negative vorticity. Here we also have a Coriolis term that comes into the mix, the 1 over f term. This implies that whenever we have an anticyclonic applied stress, that is, in the northern hemisphere we have a clockwise applied stress, and in the southern-hemisphere a counterclockwise applied stress, this curl, k dot curl term will be negative. On the other hand, if we have in the northern hemisphere counterclockwise rotation, or in the southern hemisphere counterclockwise rotation, then this k dot curl term will be positive. So how does that work out for the ocean then? If we have an anticyclonic applied stress because of the wind field, we then have a uh, we then have convergent motion, which is then responsible for driving a negative vertical velocity. This in the ocean, this is known as downwelling. That is, we have ocean waters at the surface that are being pushed downwards. So this anticyclonic stress then induces convergence and downwelling in much the same way a local surface low in the atmosphere would also induce convergence. On the other hand, if we have a cyclonic applied stress, again this is a counterclockwise rotation in the northern hemisphere, then we have divergent motion and upwelling. In the case of upwelling, ocean waters are pulled from depth in order to replace waters that diverge from the near surface. So in summary, anticyclonic stress induces Ekman pumping, that is, negative ve vertical velocities associated with pumping near surface waters to depth. Cyclonic stresses are associated with Ekman suction, that is, sucking waters up from depth in order to replace waters that diverge at the surface. Anticyclonic applied stresses are then analogous to surface lows in the atmosphere, and cyclonic applied stresses are analogous to surface highs. Okay, how does this apply then to the ocean gyres? Well, in the northern hemisphere, the subtropical gyre is associated with easterlies to the south and westerlies to the north. This is then an anticyclonic rotation. Recall that anticyclonic rotation is associated with Ekman pumping. So the presence of these ocean gyres then result in water being pumped from the near surface to depth. That is, we have a vertical velocity 
uh, a negative vertical velocity which is induced because of the anticyclonic rotation in this gyre. We can look at a plot of the global pattern of Ekman vertical velocity as a function of location. In the regions where we have anticyclonic ocean currents, namely the subtropical gyres, we see negative vertical velocities because of the presence of, those, uh, of the uh, anticyclonic rotation. Namely, we see these cooler blue colors indicative of water being pushed to depth. On the other hand, in the polar regions, which are associated with cyclonic rotation, what we instead see is positive vertical velocities as water is pulled up from depth through Ekman's suction. The amount of water that is actually pushed to depth or pulled up is very small. The units of this, uh, the units shown in this map are actually meters per year. So it's not a very significant amount, and this is reflective of the fact that ocean currents do operate very slowly. The ocean does operate on much longer timescales than the atmosphere, so this is perhaps not surprising. Over very long timescales, nonetheless, the Ekman velocities are important for changing the vertical structure of the ocean. This theory cannot be used to explain what occurs in the equatorial regions, because in these regions the Coriolis parameter is approximately zero. Recall that this parameter enters into the denominator of the previous expression for the Ekman-induced vertical velocity. So we're going to have to modify the theory somewhat. Instead of assuming a constant Coriolis parameter, we'll instead assume a beta plane. Under the beta plane approximation, we have a linearly varying Coriolis parameter with distance away from the equator. Namely, f is approximated as beta y, where y is the distance away from the equator, and beta is a constant coefficient. If we plug this now into the zonal momentum equation, we get the equation above. If we now assume zonal symmetry, namely that di p di x is equal to zero, as is a reasonable approximation uh, in the equatorial regions, and we then obtain that over the depth of the Ekman layer, that the meridional velocity induced by the wind stress is going to be given by negative tau wind x divided by beta y rho reference. This expression is nonetheless not valid when y is equal to zero, but when we, get a, when we move towards positive or negative values of y, it does indicate the, that there is a meridionally induced current velocity because of the presence of a zonal wind stress. Namely, to north of the equator, where y is positive, we have that the meridional velocity is proportional to negative tau wind x. Now, which direction is the wind blowing in in these regions? From what we know before about the general circulation of the atmosphere, recall that the wind is blowing from east to west, namely it's an easterly wind stress. So this quantity tau wind x is negative. What that means then is that north of the equator we must have that the meridional velocity is positive, and south of the equator we have that the meridional velocity is negative. So the presence of this easterly wind stress in the equatorial region then drives a divergent flow, that is, water is pushed poleward away from the equator. In order for this to satisfy conservation of mass, we must then have that there is an induced upwelling in this region where water is pulled from depth in order to replace the water that is, being, that is diverging from the equator. So now that we know that in the equatorial regions we have upwelling or Ekman suction, in the subtropics we have downwelling or Ekman pumping, and in the polar regions we have upwelling or Ekman suction, we then have a better understanding of why the uh, latitudinal vertical cross-section of the ocean looks the way that it does. Specifically, these warmer near-surface waters are pumped to depth because of Ekman pumping in the subtropics, and the colder deep ocean waters are pulled up because of the presence of Ekman suction in the, at the equator. Consequently, we have this bimodal shape associated with the thermocline. Recall that this pattern shows up in many of the fields of the ocean. We see it in the temperature field, we see it in the salinity field, and we see it in the potential density field. Thus, the Ekman layer plays a big role in impacting the interior structure of the ocean through downwelling and upwelling. Okay, 
Let's talk now about the interior ocean response. Since the Ekman layer is responsible for either inducing a positive or negative vertical velocity, it must also have an impact on flows within the interior ocean, outside of the Ekman layer, where friction is not relevant. Let's examine this using the horizontal divergence of the geostrophic velocity. Note that the geostrophic velocity is a good approximation within the interior ocean where friction is not relevant. If we take the horizontal divergence of the geostrophic velocity on a constant height surface, what we observe is that almost all the terms exactly cancel out with each other. However, since the Coriolis parameter has a horizontal variation, namely it varies meridionally from negative in near the South Pole to positive in the North Pole, then it must have a Y derivative associated with it. Using our beta plane approximation, we have that di f di y is given by this beta parameter, which again we're approximating as a constant. So if you expand out this, uh, the horizontal divergence of the geostrophic wind, you'll find that it takes on a value of negative beta over f times vg. That is, it's connected to how strongly the Coriolis parameter varies, as well as the meridional velocity of the geostrophic flow. In order to understand how Ekman pumping and suction impact these terms, we note that the full continuity equation again reads 3D divergence equals zero. Or analogously, in the interior ocean, we have that the horizontal divergence of the geostrophic flow is equal to negative di w di z. Combining this with the derivation from the last slide, we then have that beta vg is equal to f times di w di z. So on a large scale, if we have vertical motion within the ocean, it must induce an associated meridional velocity. This meridional velocity arises because of horizontal variations in the Coriolis parameter. In the abyss, the velocities are much smaller than the vertical velocities near the surface. So what is effectively happening is we have stretching of fluid columns between the surface and the abyss. If w is approximately zero in the abyss, then this di w di z term can be approximated as w surface over the height between the surface layer and the abyss. So we can obtain an approximate formula, beta times the uh, integrated meridional velocity that is the average meridional velocity through that column, is equal to f times w Ekman over the height of uh, between the surface and the abyssal layer. Hence, Ekman pumping in the mid-latitudinal gyres, specifically where we have a negative vertical Ekman velocity, naturally drives an equatorward circulation. That is, if w is negative in the northern hemisphere and f is positive, then this must induce a negative vg. That is, we have a southward meridional velocity induced by uh, downwelling from the Ekman layer. In the southern hemisphere, the exact situation is flipped, but we have the same basic result. Downwelling results in an equatorward flow, whereas upwelling, or Ekman suction, results in a poleward flow. So what does this mean? Well, through the De through the whole width of the oceanic gyres, we must have that the Ekman pumping will induce equatorward velocities. That is, in general, throughout this width of the gyre, we have that most of the ocean water is moving towards the equator. In order to satisfy conservation of mass, we must then have a region where friction is relevant, where waters are then pulled to poleward. If this were not the case, then we would have that ocean waters just move towards the equator without having a counter circulation to satisfy conservation of mass, and so they would not be in an equilibrium state. So the overall structure of these gyres then shows mid-latitudinal westerlies to the north, again in looking in the northern hemisphere, tropical easterlies in the south near the equator, and a general equatorward flow uh, that appears through the extent of the gyre. 
In order to compensate for this, we must have a strong western boundary current where the interior ocean derivation does not apply because now frictional forces in this near boundary region are relevant that then compensates for the overall equatorward flow. The lack of a strong equatorward eastern boundary current can be explained analogously. If most of the flow throughout the gyre is already moving equatorward, then there's little mass in order to support a strong eastern boundary current. This behavior can also be seen by integrating over the top 1,000 meters of the ocean. This then captures some of that interior ocean behavior where velocities are still substantial enough to be picked up. What we see is in the northern hemisphere a general tendency within the ocean gyres to have equatorward flow that is shown by the slightly cool colors through the northern subtropics. Analogously, in the southern subtropics, we see positive meridional velocities as through the extent of the gyres, we see waters that are pushed towards the equator. We see a strong boundary current in both plots on left and right, corresponding to the Gulf Stream in the Atlantic, the Kurashio Current in the Pacific, and the Brazil Current in the South Atlantic. These currents are then these strong western boundary currents responsible for replacing mass that is being pushed towards the equator through the extent of the gyres. Also note that there is no evidence here of a strong uh, equatorward boundary current along the eastern edge of these basins, as expected. There's another interpretation that can also be used in order to understand why we have strong western boundary currents and weak eastern boundary currents. This relies on the Taylor-Proudman theorem that we discussed previously. Recall that for an incompressible fluid that is rotating, we have that the fluid retains a two-dimensional character associated with it. That is, the flow velocity cannot change in the direction of the rotation axis. This then leads to the existence of Taylor columns. However, because Ekman pumping does lead to convergence within these oceanic gyres, we then must have that there is a vertical velocity in the Ekman layer that is responsible for pumping fluid to depth. Consequently, the volume of these Taylor columns must change because fluid is being pumped into them. There are two mechanisms in which the volume of the fluid can change. It can either change through an expansion of the Taylor column laterally, or it can change by stretching of the Taylor column, namely by it growing in height. However, if Ekman pumping caused an increase in the radius of the fluid column, then conservation of angular momentum would eventually require that the angular velocity around the boundary of this Taylor column would asymptote to zero. So we wouldn't see any flow velocity over time. However, that's not the case. We still clearly see that there is motion in the ocean. So it must instead be the case that the Ekman pumping instead drives an increase in the height of the fluid column. Well, how can this occur? Obviously, the bottom of the ocean is at a fixed depth. Well, you have to recall that the Taylor column interpretation doesn't say that it's the vertical depth that defines the Taylor column, but instead it is the depth of the fluid aligned with the rotation axis. Namely, on the plot on the right here, we see that the Taylor columns in a fluid around the Earth are straight lines aligned with that rotation axis. So this provides a mechanism by which we can actually stretch the Taylor columns. Namely, if these Taylor columns need to expand in volume and consequently need to expand in height, we can actually just move the columns from higher latitudes to lower latitudes. By doing so, we have a longer Taylor column overall, because again, those Taylor columns are aligned with the rotation axis. So in the figure, as the Taylor column moves from position D1 to position D2, it stretches in the process, increasing in volume and moving equatorward. This mechanism, using the Taylor column interpretation, then provides an alternative explanation as to why Ekman pumping drives an equatorward circulation. So in these oceanic gyres, we must have a general motion of oceanic wa waters towards the equator. Okay, let's talk about Sverdrup theory. 
This word drop theory pops up in, try in explaining why exactly we have an equatorial countercurrent. Recall that this equatorial countercurrent is actually counter to the imposed wind stress. We discussed last time that the wind stress does not impose a Dirichlet or no-slip boundary condition on the oceanic surface, so it does make sense that the wind velocity does not need to match the ocean velocity. Nonetheless, the presence of this oceanic uh, countercurrent is mystifying. It does move in the opposite direction of the prevailing winds. Okay, let's see if we can understand why this is the case. Recall that for a constant Coriolis parameter, the geostrophic wind is divergence-free. However, since f is not constant on the surface of the sphere, namely, again, applying the beta plane approximation, we have that there is some horizontal variation associated with the Coriolis parameter, and so on a constant height surface, the geostrophic wind is not exactly divergence-free. Meridional variations in the Coriolis parameter in conjunction with the continuity equation then showed that if you have a vertical velocity induced by Ekman pumping or suction, you must have an induced meridional velocity in the interior ocean as well. However, the beta plane also pops up in Sverdrup theory, which is used to explain the presence of the equatorial countercurrent. To do so, we're going to start with the momentum equations, including terms for Coriolis, pressure gradient, and friction. We're going to cross-differentiate these terms by first differentiating the first equation, namely the zonal momentum equation with respect to y, and the second momentum equation with respect to x. Taking the difference between these two then leads to a term that is, leads to the presence of a term that looks like di u di x plus di v di y. If we then substitute in the continuity equation, namely di u di x plus di v di y equals negative di w di z, we'll then, it will then obtain the expression on the bottom. Note that here we are twice differentiating the wind stress. So we're now going to take this equation and we're going to integrate it from the bottom of the ocean at some depth z equals negative capital D to the very top. At both the bottom and top of the ocean, we must have that the vertical velocity is equal to zero. That is, there is no water that is leaving the ocean surface and none which is penetrating through the bottom of the ocean. If we do so and apply some calculus, we obtain that beta times capital V is equal to negative one over rho reference k dot curl of the wind stress. Here, capital V is the integral over depth of the meridional velocity. This expression is known as the Sverdrup relation, and it relates the meridional velocity to the wind stress, and it applies even if the Coriolis force is approximately equal to zero, such as in the equatorial regions. It instead relies on a meridional variation of the Coriolis parameter. So let's examine this relationship quickly. If we assume that the wind is purely zonal, that is, there's no meridional wind stress, then this relationship reduces to beta capital V equals negative 1 over rho reference times di tau wind x di y. So where is meridional transport zero? Namely, where is the left-hand side zero? Well, it'll be zero where the, vari the meridional variation of this zonal wind stress is equal to zero. What else can be learned from this Ferdrop relationship? Well, let's consider the continuity equation and integrate it over the depth. Since the integral is taken over dz, we can use fundamental theorem of calculus to expand the di w di z integral term in terms of the velocity at the top and bottom. Again, recall these are equal to zero. So then using the expressions for capital U and capital V, we can see that, these, that the horizontal divergence, that is di u di x plus di v di y, of these integrated quantities is equal to zero. That is, it is divergence-free. From the Sverdrup relationship, and using the fact that this flow is divergence-free, it turns out that we can write the bulk horizontal velocities in terms of a stream function. That is, there is a single field, psi, that can be used to represent the velocities. This is a natural consequence of fluid mechanics. Uh, the stream function can then be obtained by integrating the Sverdrup relationship that is, by substituting in v equals di psi di x and integrating from the 
uh, eastern boundary to uh, a position x in the ocean basin. Consequently, we get an expression for the stream function below. The stream function is useful because it is always uh, parallel to the direction of flow. That is, fluid parcels will tend to move along lines of constant stream function. So if we can plot out these stream function contours, we can get a good feel of the direction in which fluid parcels are moving. But even beyond that, we can take this stream function and use uh, the definition of u from the previous slide in order to obtain an expression for capital U in terms of the wind stress. Or analogously, we can simply apply that the uh, horizontal divergence of these depth integrated quantities is equal to zero and solve the integral relationship using the Sverdrup relationship on, a, on the top of this slide. If we then assume that there is again no meridional wind stress, we can obtain the uh, an expression for the zonal bulk flow in terms of the zonal wind stress. And what we see is in fact that the bulk flow is not exactly proportional to the direction of the zonal wind stress, but instead that it's proportional to the second derivative of that wind stress. So this already gives us a pretty important clue in order to understand why the equatorial countercurrent is present. Let's look at the wind stress field. Where is wind stress largest and where is it lowest? Well, it's obviously quite large in the Antarctic circumpolar current. It's also quite large in the northern hemisphere along that polar band. But we also have large values of the wind stress in the subtropical regions, that is at about 15 degrees north and south, but these wind stresses drop off as we get closer to the equator. That is, the equatorial band is associated with relatively lower wind stresses than to the north and to the south. Here's a plot showing the wind stresses on the left-hand side. If we take the zonal mean of these wind stresses, we see strong westerlies occurring in the mid-latitudinal regions. And we see the trade winds, which are easterly flows, which are located in at about 15 degrees north and south. But these winds weaken as we go towards the equator. That is, they go towards zero. So we end up with a decrease in winds as we go into the trade wind region. Uh, then we see those winds moving towards zero, towards the equator, and then we see the winds picking up again as we move into the southern hemisphere. Recalling that the uh, current velocity is going to be proportional to the second derivative of the wind stress and not the wind stress itself, this tells us then what the direction of the local current velocity will be. In At about 45 degrees north and at about 50 degrees south, the second derivative is associated with an inverted parabola. That is, we have a uh, parabola which is peaked at larger values and decreases as you go farther away from that peak. Consequently, the second derivative of the, uh, of the wind stress is negative in these regions, and so they're associated with a positive zonal current velocity. In the trade winds regions, we see normal parabolas. The second derivative of these parabolas is positive, and so the zonal current velocity is easterly. However, in the equatorial regions, again we see a inverted parabola associated with the wind stress. This inverted parabola is then going to be associated with a westerly current velocity. Again, because the second derivative of that wind stress will be negative. So this naturally gives rise then to the presence of this equatorial countercurrent associated with a negative uh, second derivative of the zonal wind stress. The plot in the middle shows the streamlines of the Sverdrup stream function. We can see along these streamlines the presence of the equatorial countercurrent, the presence of the north equatorial currents, as well as the presence of the North Pacific Current and the Antarctic Circumpolar Current. So the Sverdrup theory is then very effective at explaining why the currents are pointing the direction that they are in the Pacific Basin. Similar logic applies outside of the Pacific as well, and we see a similar character associated with these uh, current velocities. Here's a idealized image showing exactly what I discussed on the previous slide. The presence of mid-latitudinal westerlies are associated with westerly currents. 
The trade winds regions are associated with easterly currents. These two regions then bound the subtropical gyres that are associated with the largest regions of rotation within the ocean. The doldrums, which are again associated with a negative second derivative in the wind stress, are associated with westerly flow again, hence giving rise to the equatorial countercurrent. North and south of the equatorial countercurrent, we, we see the southern and northern extents of the subtropical gyres, and so here we again see easterly flow. The Ekman transport in these regions, that is, the mass transport that in the northern hemisphere is to the right of the direction of motion, induces downwelling through the subtropical gyre, and it induces upwelling in the subpolar gyres, as well as upwelling along the equatorial band. Alright, that's enough for today. Thank you very much.